just listen. Those that really do make it are the guys that are, are prepared to push through it um, and to learn out of it and, and, and come out top, on top on the other side. Okay, cool. So uh, thanks for doing this, man. I appreciate it. Cheers. But how has it been so far? Has it, uh, all the interviews gone okay? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always uh, a challenge, you know, learning a new skill, but I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. So it's always been good. I can imagine that the scenes of the guys that you've spoken to up to now have been, I mean, obviously, you know, great guys, but high profile. And so I'm sure you would have got a lot of insight from a lot of experience. I saw you chatted to Follis the other day as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited to launch that one because there's a lot of traction with all the old boys with that one. So obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, fully a lack of, of knowledge. So obviously. Just, yeah, I know we, um, look, I'm, I'm sitting here at school and he, um, oh, actually in his old office <laughs> where he used to sit. And uh, he comes, he said, parks across. I see him come past each and every day, basically going up to the top, to, uh, to the union office and have coffee and so on. So, yeah. Is he still involved with the cricket there by you guys? No, not necessarily. He's basically, um, I think, you know, with Audrey coming in as director, um, when when Andre Bester was still coach, I think Fortis was then then involved. Um, but look, we we've been trying to keep him involved as a as a mentor and and almost like a father figure to the cricket, you know. And especially now with the indoor centre, we're trying to get up and going. You know, we've made a lot of uh, we've relied on him a lot in terms of the contacts and getting the old boys involved and supporting and so on. So you know, he's, you know, he's not if you want to say officially involved, but but very much still part of what we do. Yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, I think you can't not have someone like that around if he's available. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't you use him? No, for sure. Now, look, I mean, you know, the the game might have moved on to a certain degree and, and so on, but just you know, he's got away with people and and with kids, obviously that. Um, yeah, there are not many others that I've met have got. So, you know, it's, 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 as you say, it's, he's senseless not to make use of his, his knowledge and experience. Yeah, for sure, yeah. And yeah. Uh, what is the setup now? Are you the, the first team coach or the cricket pro or how does that work exactly? So, so Audrey's, Audrey Swanepoel is director of cricket. Um, and then, look, for the lack of a better title, I, I probably, I've been termed as a cricket specialist. But I think basically it, it's... Look, I assist. I, I'm assistant coach to the first team to to Vian Roche, who's the who's the first team coach, okay. and because they wanted me to be the first team coach, and I said, look, guys, I'd prefer to be involved in a more holistic role um, with all the different age groups, you know. So in that sense, I I help out with from under nine all the way up to under nineteen, um, with with the coaching the coaches and and then obviously all the different sessions, and then when the first team uh, when they train. I help a coach there, and then obviously with, on the weekends with the, with the games, I, I'm involved there. So, yeah, yeah it's, um, it's a nice way to be, you know, to almost, almost oversee the structure with Audrey to, you know, develop a bit of a pipeline uh, from the primary school upwards. Because I think that's, you know, that's obviously the way sports and, and school sports moving in the sense that it's becoming pretty much a high performance system. Yeah. Um, and it just makes sense to have the continuity, you know, because then it allows you to coach a guy that comes from the primary school. Um, you know, you've got a certain technical level that you can then just progress from there instead of having to start from scratch. Yeah, yeah. I actually spoke to Vessel over the weekend, uh, the rugby guy at Gray. And he yes. Said he's trying to do the same thing. Obviously, not from prep school or primary school, but from the grade eights to yes, the, a structure that everyone follows, kind of the same type of thing. So yeah. Obviously, very helpful. Yeah. No, for sure. And are you doing anything outside of? Uh, Outside of Gray, or was that your... Yeah, look, at, well, I'm, I'm st- my final year of studies at the moment. Um, I'm doing a um, business and, and sports management uh, degree through Hertfordshire University in the UK. Okay. Um, I started that when we were still playing county cricket um, a couple of years ago. Um, they were quite fortunate there that if you play county cricket, you've got access to their... Um, Players Association, who has a lot of links to their universities, and, and I started this um, this degree, as I say, uh, 2017. So yeah, I'm pretty much on the last final year now, and a couple of semesters to go. So yeah, an off time outside of cricket that's keeping me busy early at morning and late at night. Um, but yeah, so I'm almost done with that, and then 
I'm involved in the agency space with, with uh, Navigant uh, Agency Group, which is uh, my colleague there is, is Weber van Weyck and, and on the rugby side, BSA Duplessis and those guys. So look, that's, I, I am involved there. I, mean, I haven't got a lot of players that I basically one or two players that I represent, but that's the early phases. Um, and then, you know, here and there, I help out with the ad hoc sort of commentary stint with, with super sports and so on, you know, when need to be. So and it's, it's, I think it's a case of trying to figure out exactly what my niche market and where I'd exactly fit in. Um, you know, so it's, it's exciting and it's different times when you make that transition from, from the end of your playing career to, to the next phase, basically. Yeah, it's, it's something I'm extremely interested in at the moment. Um, just working with a couple of young sportsmen that gave up their, their sports, athletes mostly, and they're challenging yeah. integrating back into kind of normal life. Um, yes. So one thing I want to cover with you is, is kind of the process you went through and, and maybe yeah. the stresses you faced through that process. Sorry, I've lost you. At the age of, I think, around about 30 or 31, you go through a process where you, you, start, you start to realize, okay, hang on, this is, this is going to start to come to an end. Um, and, and then you're like, okay, but what, what now? What's the plan and what's going to happen? And just that, that from a mental point of view, I think the guys, players, start, start stressing about it and they start worrying about it. Um, you know, and, and maybe then takes your mind off your actual job or your career, if you want to put it, in terms of your performances and your training, because your mind's about what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Um, and and I, we've obviously done quite a bit of research, research and studying on it in the sense that, yeah, and I know that there's been investment in it from a UK perspective and also in South Africa with the players' associations is to, okay, how can we, how can we prepare the players as best as possible to to ensure that there is a smooth transition um, going from one career to another. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the sooner those conversations can take place within a, in a player, the, the better. So, um, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of distraction. If I say distraction, there's a lot happening in a guy's career at the age of 24, 25. Um, be it he's playing in the IPL or he's playing... Uh, rugby in the European leagues or, or something like that and, and things are flourishing and then all you want to do is really just focus on playing yeah. but you know there's obviously investments and savings and capital that needs to you know from a financial point of view there needs there's management needed and also then uh, just more specifically career planning you know as to okay, well what is your what are you going to do when you finish um, yeah. and I think that there's a lot of um, uh, investment and time that could be spent in that. And I think a lot of guys are, are, are putting that time in at the moment from a business point of view. But I think from a playing point of view, to just be to, some, to everyone's benefit that the sooner those conversations can take place with them, it will be to their benefit from a playing point of view because I think that you get a wider perspective on, on what's happening in your life. And secondly, um, you can relax and actually just focus on your cricket because you know that that's in place and, and, and you're putting those plans in place. You know? Yeah. Now, I've, I've kind of thought about starting a, a, a program called Life After Sport. Um, yeah. And putting together something because, I mean, someone like you, you've, you've had quite a successful career. Um, but the amount of players that fall away at the age 26, 27, when they've decided, look, it's going nowhere. Um, and yeah. They seem to, to have built their identity within their sport. And now it's about you're still forming your own identity at that age and kind of thing. And yes. you've got a former career. Some of your friends yeah. are getting married. Some of them are, uh, yeah. are working and, and, and got degrees and you still got kind of like at uh, phase one again, you know? So, sure. So a little bit of a program to try and help these guys just adapt, find opportunities and maybe some aptitude stuff to help them find what they really love and things, you know? Yeah. No, that, that, that is really beneficial. I think it would be a, a big step in the right direction. I think it's more just an understanding of, you know, okay, what else besides your career, um, be that whatever sport it is, um, you know, that, that your, where your interests lie and to have an understanding of that because then you can just put the, the, the plans in place and get the ball rolling because, um, like you say, before you know it, and also if, if injuries or so on do take place, and all of a sudden, like you say, then you then you starting from scratch, and yeah. before you know it, most of your mates and buddies are, are well on their way and, and set up in life, and, and um, 
So yeah, I think that it's it, it really would go a long way to helping to helping a lot of athletes and, and a lot of sportsmen. Yeah, are you are you very passionate about working with uh, young adults and kids? Is that why you kind of went to there and stuff? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely something that you know, Nick. I I mean, I think you also, I, I, for some of the reason, look, I'm not the guy that's even at school, I mean, <laughs> mates would know about it. I wasn't the most academic guy, maybe because I spent too much time in Mr. Forsyth's office trying to sort out <laughs> other guys' problems. But, you know, um, no, I, I've seemed to have a knack for for people and, and, and relationships and, and, and working with people. Um, and I, I really do get um, a lot of, enjoyment out of making a difference in someone else's life and, and making them um, empowering them to to achieve their whatever their skills might be so uh, and I think that that's the, the, the nice part about where we are people say oh you know it's a school and it's great college and so on and obviously we both old boys but from a from a bigger perspective the fact that you've been in a career and out of a career it's more to me about the fact that I can work with guys and and, and help them um, holistically and mentoring them in, in making good decisions and uh, as you say from a, from a cricketing point of view yes there's the added part of the knowledge and the technical ability that you can help them develop but more more specifically it's about mentoring guys to um, to just be you know well-rounded uh, boys and, and, and leadership wise etc just to be there and, and guide them to that process so I do really enjoy that development of, of the individuals and uh, in different in different phases. Who were some of the mentors for you growing up? Because mentorship is a strong theme in all my podcasts. Um, yeah. And, and finding out why mentorship is so important and kind of where does your passion for mentoring young kids come from? And I believe it's because you maybe had some good mentors when you were young. Yeah. Can you speak about that? No, no doubt. Look, I, I think to start out with, I, I did, my, my dad was a big... Um, influence in the sense of from a mentorship point of view um, I think just you know doing the right things and, and, and making good decisions and so on uh, and looking looking at things from a bigger you know perspective um, and then you know as you go to school I, gee, I over here I mean we know Mr. Forster to me still now is a mentor that, that that I speak to a lot I mean it's almost become a from being a headmaster and a teacher and a coach to becoming a, almost a friendship and, a, and a someone that you feel like you can knock on his door which I know a lot of a lot of guys do um, and then you know at that stage when playing cricket at school um, you know you won, sorry Daku Swanepoel was our first team coaches and, and Andre Forster at your own Forster's son was also a big influence at that stage. But I think it's more about setting a benchmark then in terms of how, you know, the, the standard of, of performance and training and setting really high standards and also about being, you know, a good gentleman, I suppose. Uh, that was at school. Um, and then obviously when you get to playing and professionally, you know, I, I looked up a lot to, to guys like Alan Donald and, uh, you know, Gary Kirsten and, and those types of guys. So, you know, I suppose as you progress in your career, you, you meet and interact with different guys uh, that have, have an influence and uh, at a different stage of your life. Yeah. Um, just speaking about Alan Donald, are you involved with Free State Cricket at all with him? Uh, no, not at the moment. Um, I, I do obviously have a lot of discussions with him, uh, you know, here and there in terms of player development and and. and you know, young guys coming through the system and, and just to, you know, I think what Alan's really, since since Alan's been involved with the Knights, um, he's made it clear that, that he wants to be aware of what's happening in structures um, from a development point of view and, and what the pipeline looks like. So, you know, I think from a, from a talent identification point of view, we obviously, along with St Andrews, um, you have, you know, know what's, what's coming up in the ranks and, it, and it's good to you know, communicate with Alan and the guys there to know to let them know. Look, this these are the guys that are coming through. So that from that point of view, we do do interact and have a couple of discussions. Yeah. Just about your your background, I I seem to think and correct me if I'm wrong that you were head boy in 2001 at Craig College, right? Yeah. Uh, but you didn't play rugby. You were more hockey and cricket player. Yeah. So there's a yeah. Tradition that that the rugby players are generally the leaders or the you know the head boy. yeah. And I think you're yeah. in English class as well. Am I correct? Yeah. So yeah. Not, not a profile that we see often as head boy. 
Um, <laughs> volumes about your leadership, or maybe to just yeah, yeah. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I mean, do you want to chat about that and how kind of your background in at school and things and how it led to where you are today? Yeah, look, it's. Um, I think from from the outset, it was yeah, obviously it's a massive honor in in a school to that's got such a rich history and tradition. Um, and values to, to, to have the honor of, of being a leader and, and a head boy in, in, a, in a school like Greg College. Um, and as you say, you touched on it from a rugby point of view and the fact that you're in a, you know, not the rugby player and you're not an Afrikaans speaking guy in the classes and, and having played hockey and so on. Um, look, I didn't really pay attention to that. I, I just, you know, it, it just to me, whether I played rugby or squash or anything, you know, it, it didn't really have a bearing on what other guys and how they perceive it because of the fact that I was English and I was, I was a leader um, from, from the English side of things. Um, I just wanted to do, you know, do the job as best I can and try and lead our group and, and the school at that stage. But, the, you know, leadership then, and it was, was a lot different to way, the way it is nowadays. Um, I think it was a lot more of a authoritative style um, of, you know, do it this way because I say so, you know, and, and in reflection, um, you know, the way you see leadership at school when you're in matric and the way you see it now because of the path that you've been through is, is vastly different. So I probably sometimes look back at it think, and frown upon the way you, you go or I went about things then. But yeah, look, I, um, I suppose leadership is sort of was part of my journey as a child. I, I was in the primary school. I was, I was head boy there and then, you know, ended up being captain of most of the sports teams and so on. So it was something that I, I grew up with and I suppose I was comfortable with. It's, it's not something that you, know, you always choose to do, but um, yeah, it's just it's part of your, your upbringing. And uh, I think the, the lessons that you take out of it is, is, is incredible. But again, there's such a lot of development and learning from a leadership point of view and how your perspective changes on it as, as, we've, as we've grown as individuals. But it definitely being a leader at, at a school like Gray, obviously laid a path and then a platform to to be able to do that job in the future. Yeah, if you if you look at leadership now, having gone through an entire career, played under so many captains and coaches, been a captain yourself, now you're a coach yourself. If you could just pinpoint mm -hmm. some of the most important things that leaders, young leaders, should just consider in their style of leadership that you kind of pass on. I think. I think firstly, um, you know, uh, you know there's, there's a lot of, there's different styles of leadership and I think you've got to understand where and at what level you, you are interacting uh, and, and, and the team that you, be it corporate or business-wise or from a team point of view, understanding that the group of people that you're working with and what uh, the, the, the needs are. The reason I say that is the way you coach and under nine cricket team, for instance, and you, I mean, I, I did it on a daily basis. You'd for, go from one session of coaching under nines to, to coaching the first team at under 19 level. And, and I found that so far, I mean, it's a learning phase, but the way you interact and the language that you speak with the kids at under nine, as opposed to under 19, um, is vastly different. You know, it might be the same technical thing that you're trying to help them with, but you've got to speak to the kids at a language that they can relate to and that they can understand. Um, and then you could easily, from there, the next day, possibly be involved at a free state session or a night's cricket session, which I haven't done. But what I'm trying to get to is, is the fact that, you know, you've got to be able to adapt and understand what, what's needed at that level. Um, and everyone's got a different way of approaching it. I, I had a mass, massive influence to me was having worked with Gary Kirsten and with, um, with Paddy Upton recently in the South African team, um, where fundamentally the, their basis of leadership was servant-based leadership um, in terms of really spending time with the individual and getting to know the individual and understanding what his needs are. Um, and, and almost asking and, and facilitating a lot more than, than instruction-based leadership, if I can put it that way. Yeah. And, and I found that that made a massive difference um, because you get to know the person and the player a lot better uh, before you start maybe influencing the, the person. Um, you know, I, I give them, but I, I find...
that the balance at school level and working with kids is, is a tricky balance to maintain because they don't necessarily know the best way forward. So you, I find that you know understanding and knowing the the way to go, but maybe you need a bit more instruction and maybe a bit more initiative into guiding them in the right way. But I do find that you've got to be able to understand what the person's about first before you can have a profound influence on them as a as a leader. Yeah. And when you're playing in a in a provincial team or a South African team, it might be quite hard as a captain because a new guy comes in, there's not a lot of time to get to know them before they play with you. But when you're working with kids and you're at a school, there's a long process of getting to know them because you maybe hear about them in the staff room or you know their parents and their background and stuff. So I think yeah. the role we play as coaches at schoolboy level is so critical because we are yeah. leaders. But as you said, it's that balance between empowering the kid but also guiding them in the right direction. Yeah, exactly. That you know, sort of, you know, I, I rely a lot on 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 current teachers actually, and 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 schoolboy coaches to an extent of that they that they know what what the schoolboys need and what's required at this level. You know, um, and you do to a certain extent want to know what's happening in the classrooms and so on. And and as you say, you need to know their background at home and. Second, and, and almost more importantly, you've got to understand, I think, their, their culture their, um, and, and their background. And there's different races, different cultures, and so on. And, and you've got to be able to, um, in, a, in a team, understand individually what makes that guy tick and, and, and how to motivate one guy. is going to be totally different to and how another guy is motivated. You know, some guys, you want to obviously be firm and you've got to be hard and... Uh, and, and um, you know, in the sense that they need that direction. And other guys, you maybe need to be a bit more gentle and give them a tap on the back or, or, or whatever the case is. Just, as I say, the needs are different. And understanding that, I think, is, is a massive part of, of, of leadership. Because if you're just going to come in there with one approach and then it's my way, uh, my only way, I, I can't see that being any way um, productive and, and, and effective. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, it's changed. It used to be that way maybe back in the day, but we've got yes. to understand people now. And the science yeah. of coaching and leadership has also expanded. So we understand people much better on a psychological level. Yeah, for sure. I want to just uh, move on to, to your playing days, specifically your cricket career. So, I mean, you finished school and then it took you 10 years of first class cricket about to, until you got the nod into the purchase side. Um, yeah. That speaks volumes of your about your ability to keep going and, and keep working hard. You want to touch on that and just talk us through that experience? Nick, look, I think um, as, a, as a child, you, you know, you have these aspirations of, of wanting to play for South Africa, like any kid in South Africa does do uh, or does have in any way. Um, I, you know, also wanted to do, be like uh, A.B. de Villiers and play for South Africa at the age of 21 or 20 until you realise that those guys are freaks and they are uh, specimens of, of some different DNA. Um, and, uh, you know, I just then soon realized, look, from a, I don't necessarily have the, 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 uh, the talent and, and the abundance of talent and ability, but what I did have uh, it was obviously a work ethic and, and I try to work as hard as possible to maximize the ability that I do have. Um, and yeah, you know, soon realized that hey, um, you know, it's can, the hard work is. I hope I believe that the fact that eventually the hard work would pay pay off. Which, as you say, you know, probably I bloomed a lot later. And and at the age of I think I don't know twenty seven or twenty eight, only then became or was in the reckoning for the South African team. I mean, look, I, I travelled to the UK and and I was offered an opportunity to go and play cricket over there as a callback player. I think at the age of twenty four, twenty five. Um, because of the fact that I was about seventh or eighth in the queue in, in the South African team. I mean, you know, then at that stage, Pollock and Kluzner and Callis, Justin, Kim, I, I can carry on, were, were pretty much the guys in, in, in line. Uh, and I thought, well, yeah, I've got an opportunity to go and play cricket against the best in the world and really, um, you know, in, expand and improve your game. Uh, and then later on, obviously, the opportunity to go and play for South Africa. So, 
you know, it was obviously grateful eventually then to, to get the knot, but, you know, I think that was the foundation in realizing that, hey, uh, it, there's no easy way around this. You've got to have to put in the hours and hours of work, probably more than, than most, um, and, and try to maximize what your, you know, your ability. Yeah. Well, as you said, you, you had to fight against, fight for a spot against some of the world's best ever, you know, in, in Pollock and Callis and them as the team all rounder. And then when, they kind of ended their careers. A young guy like Wayne Parnell comes in and now it's you two reckoning for that spot. Um, so a lot of making it in cricket or in sports seems to come down to a bit of luck and timing as well. You know, um, yeah. a lot of guys work extremely hard and they, they never get the break. Uh, do you want to maybe just, yeah. just chat on that? How do you keep your head up? I mean, you, you managed to keep your head up for a long time. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a case of, I mean, the, I, it's a journey. And I think that through your experiences and along the way, you obviously, like everyone is, 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 as a sportsman, are going to go through the disappointments and you have, you know, you set yourself the goals and they don't necessarily materialize and, and you don't reach those goals. Um, and through, I suppose, your fact that you eventually experience these the disappointments, disappointments allows you perspective and um as, as you mature, I think you realize that, hey, hang on, sport or cricket is, doesn't define me as a person, you know, and I think that's the fundamental of it is I think sometimes guys um, play, play the game because you have this divide, this, um, yeah, this incredible passion for what you do and a love for what you do, that it's the be all and end all. And, and, and I think I had one discussion again with a guy like Gary Kirsten who said to me, hey, you can't you can't, your life cannot de depend on your performances. You know, you can't go to bed extremely happy when you've scored a hundred or taken a five, but then when you make a duck and you get smashed all around the park, that the world's coming to an end. Yeah. Um, and I think that was a profound discussion and then really changed the perspective. And it's something that you obviously try and instill in the youngsters nowadays. But, but coming back to the fact that, hey, um, it's a journey and, and you're going to have to be um, ex go through all these experiences and challenges and eventually you know you just got to trust and believe in the process I think that's pretty much what it is just keep your head down and, and still do the right thing just despite sometimes things not necessarily going your way I think from a mental point of view the guys are, you know that's the challenge is to say look irrespective of, of how you feel and what you go through you've got to sustain this belief that eventually um, you'll achieve what you want to achieve do you think that mindset that you describe now, is that something people are born with? Do they learn that over time? Would you call it nature or nurture? That's a, I think that's a, that's a theory, really. And again, it's an opinion-based thing, you know, how, how some guys perceive that. Um, I mean, you, you can try and develop a guy and you, and you can try and whether they have exposure to that as a young guy in, in school or sports environment or whatever where – it's it's competitive and and the guys develop that almost resilience um, to 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 and persistence to to go through these different experiences and eventually go through it, um, you know. So yeah, it's, it's, I really don't I, I don't know what the right answer with that is in terms of whether it is a nature and nurture thing, um, but I can I can tell you that you know you try and instill those values from a young age within within the, the kids and the guys and to say look that. You know, this, it, it's not meant to be easy. And, and I think there's volumes of, of sportsmen around the world, the best in the world, number ones in the world that have all been through that journey that say, look, it's, it's part and parcel of, 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 your, of your journey as a sportsman, whether you make it to the top or not. So, you know, those that really do make it are the guys that are, are prepared to push through it um, and to learn out of it and, and, and come out top, on top on the other side. How does the pressure and like the type of pressure that you face change when you go from playing, you know, provincial cricket to international cricket? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's intense. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, look, it's a general discussion that guys playing first class sport or first class cricket that will say to you, once you've made that um, step up to international cricket, you cannot describe the, the pressure and the intensity and the pace at which it comes. And look, I've always felt that um, it takes a while, obviously, as you climb the ranks, whether you go from school to university level to first class to international, 
Um, it, it takes a couple of good performances at that level to feel like you actually belong there. Um, but, but, but in terms of, because then, you know, you, you obviously develop that self-confidence and your, your mates and your people value your contribution and you feel like you're part of the team. But um, the pressure to play international cricket Nick, is, or international sport is uh, you, it's times 10, I'd say, you know, in terms of, in terms of what you feel at, at first class or domestic level. Um, look, you can talk about the fact that the TV cameras are on you the whole time and the fact that the newspapers and the media are writing about every performance and that they'll, you know, everyone's basically looking to highlight what, you, what you've done or what you haven't done. So, you know, the microscope is just so much more intense on, on terms of what your performance is. But I think eventually, the more time you spend there, you're more comfortable you, you are with those expectations. And you start to realize that you cannot control um, the external expectations and, and opinions about, about what's happening at that level. And I think the, the, the quicker you can get to a point where you simplify it in the sense that hey, you can control what you can in terms of your preparation and your performance, um, along with the with obviously the desire to want to perform at that level. Um, yeah, I think then you're on the right path. But look, there's no doubt that the pressure is immense and, and, and really intense at that level. But you've got to find a way of developing it and find your own, I suppose, specific way of, of dealing with that expectation. But I think the the, the most important thing is that. You have your own personal expectation at that level, which you can sometimes be to your detriment, but not not allowing the external ex expectation be that public media, um, et cetera, et cetera. If, as soon as you can separate that expectation uh, from from your own personal performance and your preparation, I think you're on the right path. Yeah, well, that was the next question is, how much are you driven in that space by your own internal goals and expectations and how much of your behaviors and outcomes are driven by what the media is saying and the external expectations, but you remember that quite nicely. <laughs> so yeah, so no, no, look, it's a, it's a, um, I think it's a lesson that a lot of guys. You know, I mean, I was fortunate. A lot of the guys you speak to, to Jack Callis or other guys that have said to you in the past, listen, don't bother opening up the newspaper. You know, it's it's it actually does more harm than, than any than any good at all. Um, and I think that that. The, in the earlier you can have that sort of lesson, the better, because I think if you've got I know a guy like A.B. de Villiers, who I was fortunate to play quite a bit with, uh, even from school days onwards, he, he wanted to be the best in the world, and that was his driving factor, you know, and I still think he's an ultra-competitive athlete, along with the fact that he's a freak of a, of a specimen in terms of skill. But I think you've got this drive to want to be in the best in the world, and whatever, whoever says or does is not going to stop, you know. Yeah. Um, but if you are performing at international level and you are worried about what other people say or how they perceive your performances and stuff like that, that you do sometimes take your eye on what makes you good and what makes you perform. Yeah. Is it very easy to, to forget that you're actually just playing because you love the game? You start getting caught up in the wrong things. Exactly. And I think if you come down to the, uh, again, some, there's a lot of, so a couple of good poems and stuff that I've read, but, you know, you, that's, that is what makes, that's what made you get up in the mornings when you were a kid is because you have this divine passion for what you're doing and a love for, for your game. And I think is, that should be your driving force. You know, it shouldn't be about wanting to um, prove people wrong or listen to what, what other people say about how you do things. And uh, you eventually, you're going to have to develop a thick skin <laughs> about that, I think. And then... Uh... I mean, we, you get into this team, all this pressure now suddenly as a, as a young guy in the team, um, the expectations, the media. Are there any structures in place or does the coach play a role there in helping you process yourself through that or are you kind of left to fend for yourself? I think, it's, again, it's a lot different now um, in, in, in how it was, I'm going to say, a lot of years ago. And, you know, I think as a player, you sometimes... You walk in, it depends on the environment, you know, and, and as you say, the structures that are set up around you, but if, if, if the environment is of such a nature where you do feel the freedom to, to voice your vulnerabilities and, and say you maybe feel uncomfortable about this or that, um, you know, is ideal because, you know, you, you would then feel part of the system and you feel part of the team and so on. But I think naturally as a youngster, you come in and you're just trying to find your feet. Um, I remember 
walking into the change room with my first ODI and the only place that I could find, I mean, obviously you wait, you don't just go and sit down, you know, you've got to earn your stripes. Yeah. And uh, I remember the only corner that was available was between Boucher, Callis, Smith, and I think someone else, the Villiers on the right hand side. And I was like, I was waiting, I was like, do I, do I really have to sit there? <laughs> um, you know, so, um, and, and so you feel, you, you do feel like, hey, I, I need to earn my stripes here. Well, well and, and then obviously you are a bit more in your corner and you're probably a bit more hesitant and you, and you just want to focus on what you're doing and, and focus on doing your job and, and, uh, and performing. But I think the environment has changed now and I think that the teams now are, are trying to create an environment where there's inclusivity and, and guys feel the freedom to, to speak about certain aspects, be it whether they are uncertain about a few things or whether they feel a bit vulnerable about them, which I think goes a long way in, in feeling part of the team. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's sort of my, my, my take on it. Um, yeah. Because I think that, you know, that when a guy does, is, is able to feel comfortable in environments and he feels like he can speak to different people, uh, be that the coach or, or whoever the youth sounding board is, maybe it's the fitness trainer, maybe it's the fielding coach, and maybe not, because some guys will say to you, I don't feel comfortable speaking to the coach because I don't want him to know that I feel uh, scared of the short ball or, I, you know, about playing spin or, or whatever the case is. You know, they, they don't want to have to speak to the coach about it, but maybe the guy is the is the assistant or the fielding coach or someone that, there's someone that he can, that's his go-to guy. You know, that, that sometimes is the case. But I know that, that they've tried to provide those structures nowadays for guys to be able to, to be able to interact and to speak about those things. Yeah. Who was your sounding board at the time when you were in that position? Um, I, yeah, I, I, look, my, my journey there was slightly different in the sense that I was in the team for a little bit and then out and then I came back in a season or two later. And then obviously your coaching structures would have changed as well. Um, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time with a guy like JP Dumini, who, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a mate and as a friend, I felt really comfortable speaking to. Um, and then, you know, as again, I mentioned a guy like Paddy Upton was great in the sense that he, he wasn't, uh, I don't think it was a psychologist, you know, it was more just a, a, a mentor or uh, I think they called it a high performance um, yeah analysis or yeah some something to that extent but long story short it was it was a it was a guy that we felt i felt comfortable having a cup of coffee with and saying look man this is what i feel and and would be happy to guide you through that and it really changed your perspective on things but from a from a team point of view i can tell you for sure that as a captain i knew that graham smith um i could always go to him i knew that i could always speak to him and then he made it pretty clear from the start that he said look you're in the team but my door is always open and you can always come and chat to me so um it's not like you felt like you were this in this corner and you couldn't go to him i mean those guys were always there to help you abby de villiers and those guys were always there del stain is another guy that for all this the performances that they did on the field and the, 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 uh, they were these incredible individuals and great team in, um, that you could always speak to. So um, now there was a couple of guys in that, in that group that, that really made it special to be part of. Yeah. yeah, I think it's good to hear that. It's good to know that, you know, despite the high pressure environment and whatever's being said in the news, even lately, um, that, you know, there was a good, good vibe and people did feel comfortable joining a team like that. I want to just touch on your, your disappointments and your failures. Um, cause you just mentioned being in the team and then being dropped and back in the team. How do you process yeah. that when firstly, when the failure is down to maybe your own performances and you, you can take ownership and responsibility for it, what is your kind of process of dealing with those failures? Look, I think when it's, when it's down to your own performances, you, you immediately are self-reflective and you, and, and you try and, I mean, whether, whether you've been left out of the team or whether it's a bad performance on the day, um, look, Personally, I was a guy that I put myself under a lot of pressure and I, and I set myself high standards, you know. So immediately you, you, you reflect very quickly and trying to look. And, and I think to my identity, I probably would overthink things and, um, and, and maybe look at trying to find too many faults maybe. Um, so I really, you know, reflected on my own performances and was quick to try and look and see where I could improve and, and where not. Um, but then, you know, if there's, from a selection point of view, if there's things that are, that are out of your control, it, it, it was really, it's really tough and it really is frustrating because 
you, a lot of times you maybe you feel like um, you're put in the performances, but but you, you you're not you're not selected. And look, I think that everyone at some stage in their career would have been through that and have experienced that. Um, and I think then as much look, it's still tough. You you still um, you you think well, okay, I've, I, it's not within my control. I can c- control my performances, but I can't control if you want to say perception on 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 selection. You know. Uh, be- the guys wouldn't even think of considering leaving you out, that your name should almost be first or second on the list. Uh, and that should be the ideal. But it's going to happen that that from uh, if, if it's not your performances that, hey, there's a perception on on on, on your ability and, and guys think that there's someone else that's better. And then you've got to almost take a different approach and say, well, okay, there's how much, how much of that can I control and what can I do about it? And I think sometimes... Um, that almost makes the makes the dealing with that disappointment um, a lot easier, you know. Yeah. But fundamentally, you'll go through these those disappointments, and I think the the still you've got to maintain the the bigger picture of what you're wanting to achieve and where you want to go. Because um, sometimes it does take the, the disappointment takes the the passion and the enjoyment away from what you're doing. You know, I remember 2015, obviously I had been left out of the World Cup. It did take a while after that. I, I, you do ask the questions about, okay, well, why am I actually doing this? You know, and what for? I remember going into a net session, practicing and bowling balls and thought, well, why? For who? For what? You know? Um, and it took me a journey back to almost county cricket and getting out of uh, the current environment to actually develop the love for what we do again and just enjoy the game. And, and, and then... Um, Sister Mackie, my, my Wi-Fi is struggling, but just give me a second. I'm just okay. Gonna, I've got a backup. Let me just connect to the backup, brother. Yeah, I got you. Sorry, did you miss some of that? Or no. Lo- just your very last sentence. I missed that, yeah. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. Do you want to just say that again? Yeah, no, I just, yeah, I just, I said that if you, if you eventually, um, it took me going to back, you know, county cricket and getting out of the cricket, the current environment over here to to actually find the love for playing and the, and the passion for playing again, um, and and that, that I think goes a long way sometimes in in, in just dealing with the disappointments. Is eventually what makes you get up in the morning and, and get back into the gym, get back into the training, and so on. Yeah, I think it's commendable the way you reacted because obviously, as you said, now the disappointment was was immense and. You had a very good, I think, two years before the, the World Cup. And then being left yeah. out, um, I don't know the exact dynamics if there was an injury around that time or, or whatever made them decide to not go with you. But, I mean, your response to it, publicly at least, was very, you know, respectful. And, and you kind of took it upon yourself and said, well, you know, I've got to just go and work harder. Um, how, do you, yeah. how do you get to that? I mean, there is, you could be resentful. Uh, maybe you were a little bit resentful, but you managed to keep, you know, your head yeah. right and and you didn't then go and take a cold pack deal after that. You know, you kept fighting. Yeah, look, I, I to be honest, you, yeah, after that World Cup, I, I think I was selected for a Bangladesh tour. Um, really, yeah, I mean, I was left out and then didn't play. We didn't play any South African cricket before or in between those two series, but then all of a sudden found out that I was going to be in a, um, you know, on that tour, you know. So I thought to myself, well, okay, here we are. And you try and push it as you can and then got left out again. Um, but be that as it may, um, you know, then that was part of my journey and I had to you know, deal with that. Um, and then but, uh, um, after that, I don't offer to go play county cricket, etc. And then, then that was... The decision that I said, well, okay, you know, I need to relook at things over here, and I need to make a decision was probably in, the, in my interest. You know, I think they just said the decisions got made, and and you felt like okay, it's out of your control. But okay, what's important for me here, and what do I want to achieve out of the game? And that's where the opportunity to go play county cricket, I think, was um, a good step in that direction um, to go and play there. Um, it wasn't a call back deal; it was overseas deals. Um, but, you know, I also realized at that stage, look, I was, the age, I was 32 then. And, you know, you know how four-year cycles work in terms of building up to the next World Cup. And I was realistic to the fact that the chances of me playing another World Cup for South Africa with a Chris Morris and Andile Petrukwai and the youngsters coming through, that it was probably the right time for them to now have opportunities and for them to come through and play. So 
that's why I felt it was a good time to go and play county cricket and then to come back and play um, you know, franchise cricket in South Africa and, and still be part of the structures and hopefully try and, from a, from a senior player point of view, try and um, help youngsters develop their game and, and, and um, get through the system. Do you think going over to England is something young players should consider for a couple of years? You obviously went at quite a young age. Does that help you get yes. developed? Uh, undoubtedly, and, and I know you know people will you you quickly find people saying, "Oh, yeah, but it's it's the pound and the money's good," and it, which I mean, let's not you know beat around the bush if it's it is it is the exchange rate is good, but I can tell you from a personal development point of view, it no doubt was was incredible in the sense that hey, you I said in a, in a podcast the other day that yeah, you come from Bloemfontein from a pretty um, conservative environment and in the sense that it's a small city town and now you end up going into gee, uh, Manchester, Birmingham, um, all those places. It's multicultural um, and you're playing with guys from all around the world. And So you firstly, from a cultural diversity point of view, you're learning so much um, from different people. Um, but then from a cricketing point of view, on a weekly basis, you're playing against the best in the world because every team has got two overseas players Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So your skill gets tested um, on a weekly basis, uh, and you you test it in different conditions. So now I, I would, if, if ever there's an opportunity for a guy to go and play county cricket, excuse me, I would, I would, I would definitely advocate that as much as possible because I think it holistically, over and above the cricketing side of things, it, it just is to, to to your benefit. If we can just move to your, your, the positive side of your playing, we've dealt with failures and things now, but when you were at the top of your game and you were in the team and even maybe for the free state, are there yes. specific mental skills that you used um, on a recurring basis to help with your batting, your bowling, um, or is that something that only kind of came in a bit later? Look, I think as a youngster, you sort of, I remember being at the academy, uh, South African Academy, and a lot of times their visualization um, was, was, was a big part of it um, and, and preparation. I was the guy that, that, that tried, I did use, you know, a lot of the times at night before a game, I'd, you know, lie on the bed and you think about the games and opposition that you're playing against and try and prepare and visualize who you'd be facing, who you'd be bowling to. And obviously that along with the team meetings that you'd had, was a guy that took a lot of notes um, and wrote down a lot of things because I found that that you know just from a preparation point of view I felt like it helped me I mean every guy is different other guys don't like to think about it too much and just pitch up and uh, and play on, on on feel of the day um, but yeah I was a guy that liked to to, to visualize a lot of uh, a lot of the time um, but as, as you progress in your career you obviously um, you get you experience and you get to learn and know so much of, of, of the guys that you're playing against, you know, so you understand what it's about. Um, but from, yeah, as I say, visualization, visualization was a big part of, of, of what I, what I did. Um, you know, I, I was a guy in the, in the, once the game had started, I was pretty clear in my mind about what I wanted to achieve, you know, and I wanted to make sure that I, from a preparation point of view, left, left no stone unturned so that, um, you know, when the game started, I could just go out and perform. But but that was that was basically you know how I I, I tried to prepare. But um, it was also through mistakes. You know, I was a guy that physically over prepared. I sometimes went too far in terms of physical conditioning. Okay. That by the time the game came, as a youngster, I was actually tired, and it needed a couple of discussions with coaches and with Graham Smith and and. I think Corey Fonsale at that stage would have said, listen, you need to balance this out a bit because you, you're overtraining and you're not fresh when the game comes. So then as you progress in your career, there's more mental training and less physical training. If I not say a smarter physical training, but more mental preparation, if I can put it that way. Yeah, yeah. If you consider all the, the guys you've played against, have you, is there some things that you've seen played against all four so all with sorry um mm -hmm. are there some funny or, or interesting uh things you've seen people do to help them prepare that that you don't normally see sure i'd have to go on memory bank yeah um look i no i i can't say the specific events or ways guys you know i i mean i remember seeing 
uh, and every time I know in cricket in the cricket circles is, is, is being spoken about a lot but guys like Matthew Hayden and uh, and Justin Langer were opening batters for, for Australia who on the day before a test match would literally go and sit on the on the pitch that they're playing at without any shoes on without anything and just sit there and I suppose visualize again who they're facing who they're coming up against the, the, the next day I suppose trying to imagine what the environment is going to be like, the amount of people, the noise. I think it's about just being comfortable with what that space is going to be like the next day with you perform. And that is something that did stick in my mind. And I almost tried to apply that. And I found that it actually worked quite a bit. Um, but that's one different way of, of preparation that stuck out in my mind. Look, you can talk. Um, you can talk in, in, in terms of uh, superstitions and, and rituals that a lot of the guys had. I know guys had like teddy bears and, and whatever the case is under their bags. I mean, Neil McKenzie, uh, you know, everyone knows about, you know, rituals and all those types of things. But look, um, I, I think fundamentally it comes down to what you feel comfortable with on a play and what, what gets you in the right space. Be that rituals, be it about putting the left shoe on first or in terms of mental preparation, um, it's about being in a comfortable space, I think, that, that makes you walk out and feel like, okay, I'm now ready to, to, to do battle. Yeah, yeah. I find that very interesting how some guys don't need it at all. I guess, like, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing someone like Quinton the Cock doesn't do too much thinking and, and mental preparation before the time. Um, but then you get yeah. someone like, like Neil Mack, who obviously everyone knows about him. And, uh, his stuff, yeah. So. Yes. Um, as a coach, it's quite important to understand and give the players freedom before a match or before an innings to express themselves in whichever way it helps them. Sorry, I just lost you a bit there. Sorry, just say that again. So I said, um, as a coach, it's quite important to, to understand each person individually and, and what, you know, give them freedom before a match or an innings to, to express themselves. <laughs> yeah, but that's, look, I can speak volumes, I mean, again, in terms of seeing how guys are and, and the space that they needed. You know, some guys, uh, opening batters, you try and um, they'd want to be psyched up and they'd want to um, see they need music or whatever the other guys would want, just quiet space in their corner. And, and it's about understanding those individuals. And it takes time to get to, get to know that, you know. Um, other guys, again, as you say, would you just stern talking to where a guy like, uh, guy like David Miller, um, you'd want to push out the door and, and say, see the ball and play and not let him overthink it. Uh, I think that's the art of, of coaching. What I've learned over the years is the fact that you've got to, that, the, the challenge of understanding each and individual and what, what gets, what, how you get the best out of it. Because, um, it's, again, you can't have a one-dimensional approach. I, I think, you know, you could really... You, you would it would be tough for, for the guys and you won't get out to, to get the best out of them if you if you take on that approach so no there's there's plenty of, of, of ways in which I've seen it happen um, you know as I say in the South African context alone some guys would just just want a quiet chat other guys would be bouncing around other guys would be reading the newspaper I remember watching put up and I read the newspaper before he goes out to bat you know yeah. um, so now there's, diff there's different ways, there's different, uh, there's different methods. And I think that is the challenge as a coach, as a leader, that you've got to understand that how that person works and how he operates before you can actually um, have an have a effect on, on how he, and improve his performance. Yeah, yeah. If we can keep on the, the coaching topic, um, you being involved with schools and stuff or with a school, how do you yeah. balance the, you know, the development side, especially with young kids, and that winning at all costs mentality because you and I will both agree that winning is obviously very important, but sometimes it might be too important. Um, how do you yeah. as a coach at school level balance those two? Look, I think, you know, you, with, you both know with you also being at, at Grave, for instance, who's got a, a really a strong drive and a highly competitive, um, you know, environment and a culture that's that's based on wanting to win and especially from the sports side of things and um, you almost you know, the youngsters coming into the school it's this you know you it's almost this expectation you know look the years before you have been successful and they've won and like the rugby teams have been unbeaten for years and and the other sports teams have been very successful and it's almost like well hey you've got it they, they feel like they have to win and I've noticed this and I've picked this up 
Um, and it's as a as an old boy that's been part of it, but someone that's also travelled and been out and had a career and come back. You've got to almost separate yourself from from the school uh, and and almost what that expectation is, um, and try and make sure that you are you're coaching the person and the team and the individual. And so I, I feel like. Yes, you want to coach the guys to win and you want, because winning is important. I mean, why would you have a scoreboard then, you know? Um, so I do feel that that really is important. But I come back to what we discussed on earlier. On. I, to me, it's also about the holistic development of the child and about the person. So while you, while you yes, you, you're wanting to set a high standard and a benchmark for them to prepare and to train at a high intensity, because if they're going to make a career, but that's what they're going to be exposed to after school but you want to be able to understand the perspective of what, what sport is in their life. And you want to be able to teach them to understand dealing with disappointment and dealing with the losses because you know, as well as from a professional point of view when it comes to sport, that you're probably going to lose more times than what you win. So, you know, you've got to be able to teach them that and help them to deal with that. And so the, the winning at all costs thing to me, I, I feel is a very dangerous thing. Um, and, I've, and I've noticed that um from a from a parenting point of view that that is a very big obstacle at the moment and it's a very big challenge because sometimes i feel like the kids are are suffering as a result of maybe they feel the pressure at school to want to win but they've also got the pressure at home to have to perform that that my child has to do this or he has to do that yeah which i'm a b i i'm very concerned over that in the sense that i want to be able to coach and 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 develop the holistic individual but I want to be able to ha encourage having fun as well because if, if you can't have fun and you can't enjoy and he feels like he's having to perform and having to win at all costs at school I can pretty much guarantee you that at the age of 20 or 21 when it really does count professionally he's going to lose the, lose the drive and lose the the will to want to carry on uh, so that's my that's my take on it, and I feel that we've got a responsibility both from a parenting point of view and both from a coach's point of view. That what's in the interest of the child here? What's in the interest of his development? To make sure that if he does get a that we give him the best chance of making a career of something if he is good enough eventually. Yes, and if he isn't, he's learned other developmental skills through that process that help him become success just in life. Correct, because I feel like. I, I can, I'm pretty confident in saying that there's a lot of guys that would have played first team sport at school level that would have had a coach or some sort that would have, he might, he might not have made a career out of what he's doing in, from a sports point of view, but those values that have been instilled on him at sports level, he's definitely been able to um, use in another, um, in, in another career. Yeah. I think it was Foley that once said, uh, said to me he's probably said it a lot but he says um sport is the practice ground for life and that's why it's uh, yeah yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. um i want to move on to some questions that people sent through on instagram and facebook um when i put out <laughs> okay so some of them might be hard some of them might be silly but i'm just going to go through them um the first sure. one, um what are so what are some of the fundamental skills that you think players should learn now from a bowling point of view that maybe wasn't as important in the past in, in terms of, you know, how cricket's developed? Um, I think, uh, firstly, from a coaching point of view, the, the, the main, the, the, from, a, from an action, from a technical point of view, the, the main thing that we try and get the guys to do is to, to make sure that biomechanically their actions are, if you want to say, um, I'm not say injury free, but given the best chance of, of preventing injuries. So I think that's the first and foremost, um, you know, in terms of understanding what the guy's action is and understanding whether he's a side on or a semi, you know, semi open or semi closed action or a, or a front on action to be firstly identify the fundamentals there and biomechanically get the right things in place um, to prevent injuries happening at the age of between, you know, let's say from 15 or 16 when the guys go through really big growth spurts, etc. So I think that's the first important thing. Um, and then you, you try and encourage and understand what, you know, when you have an understanding of how the guy bowls is to then try and get, if you say, without 
changing too much. You know, you also want to, what, a guy's natural bowling action is his natural action. You know, it doesn't help you try and get everyone to be bowling out swingers and bowl fast and stuff. So I think you try and build around what the guy's fundamentals are and what his action is about and get the best out of it. Um, but, you know, so those, that would be my first fundamentals. Um, and then secondly, I think, oh, sorry, thirdly is the game is obviously moving towards fast paced and T20 cricket and one day cricket, etc. where from a bowling point of view, I feel like as much as what people say, it's a baddest game, which it probably, probably is, you know, you're on a hiding to nothing because commercially people want to see runs on the board and they want to see fours and sixes, but bowlers can, bowlers can win you the games. And uh, I think that your stock and your value as a bowler it will be so high as, as a youngster if you can quickly learn to obviously play in test cricket but, and four-day cricket. But if you've developed the skill set and the variation to be able to perform in T20 cricket, um, I think it will go a long way and it gives you the best chance of a career because, um, I mean, that's, that's the way that the game is going. Look, I'm a purist and I still love test cricket and I think it is the most important part of the game still. But from a young, a young child's point of view uh, or a young cricketer's point of view, you want to be able to give yourself the best chance of either being able to play four-day cricket or test cricket or then, you know, T20 cricket. Yeah. Yeah, and that, I mean, that includes, um, the, the T20 cricket includes obviously the slow balls, the b- ability to bowl a Yorker when you want to, but in, in test cricket, there's a whole different skill set and it comes down to yeah, consistency yeah. And, and working yeah. the plan and all those type of things. Yeah, look, I, sorry, the one thing I probably didn't add to that, Nick, from a bowler's point of view and up-and-coming bowlers is that you've got to understand that bowling, you need to be fit, you need to be strong. Uh, there's no, you do the donkey work, there's no hiding from that and you've got to be able to play within a pain threshold because the days that your body feels 100% as you get older, as you go on, is very few and far in between. So you need to, at an early stage, invest in your body and be fit and be strong and do the necessary prehab and rehab and recovery sessions to be able to sustain a long career within bowling. Because if you don't have that and you don't, you aren't fit and you don't look after yourself and um, you don't have a pain threshold, it's, it, it's bowling's not it's not not for the faint heart. Put it that way. Yeah, what I've seen, I've been involved with quite a lot of schools. Um, in Cape Town mostly and what I've seen is that a lot of times that part is completely ignored you know we have kids bowling three days a week at practice and they're playing time cricket on the weekend they're playing club cricket or free or you know Western Province cricket. yes and uh, there's absolutely no prehab and conditioning being done in between um, yeah so maybe at school level because that's when our bodies are developing it's one of the most important things that school should start considering no, definitely. It's a, uh, I mean, yeah, I know it's great at the moment. We put quite a big emphasis on the conditioning side of things to make sure that, you know, you give the guys the best chance of, of um, physically developing and, and making sure that their actions are clean and that their cores are strong. Because as you say, you're going through growth spurts and added to that, the, the other conditioning challenge you have is that these guys are playing rugby or hockey or something in the winter as well. So, which to me is a good thing because it's, it, it offers a different conditioning and a different development, which is to the, you know, I mean, we've seen it on plenty of occasions where South African sportsmen at some stage played eight, a very competitive sport at a, at a high level at school level, which I think is a very good thing in their development. But um, to come back to that, it's, it's a big investment from a bowling point of view to make sure that the guys are physically conditioned and, and well looked after, especially at that age from, let's say, 13, 14 onwards. Awesome. So the next question is um, the best player you've ever played against. But I want to change that because we've, we know you've played against A.B. de Villiers, Virat Kohli, and I, I know maybe it is one of those answers, but maybe not. But I don't necessarily want just a... Yeah. Obvious answer. So let's say the most, the toughest, mentally toughest player you've ever played with or against. Um, on a, to the first name that domestically comes to mind over here um, in South Africa, who is a mate of mine, uh, is Dean Algo, who I believe is mentally is very, very tough. I mean, technically he's not, doesn't look pretty, and he'll tell you that, but he's extremely tough I and mean, extremely driven. Um, and there's plenty internationally, 
uh, in terms of toughness and, and, and opponents, um, I'd have to have to cast my mind back. Um, If I go through the ranks in, in county cricket, see there was some there was some hard <laughs> some hard guys. <laughs> Tinek, I'll have to think about it. I think carefully. Um, South Africans over here, obviously. Look, Obi, no doubt. Yes, we know he's, he's he's obviously tough. And the reason I say tough is I mean, not necessarily because he can hit you all around the park, because he's mentally also very very competitive. He was one of them. Ashul Prince, I can tell you, was mentally very tough and a tough competitor in terms of batting and wouldn't give an inch. Um, trying to think of, of internationally. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Because if you think of all the teams of, of West Indies in, in Sri Lanka, um, I tell you, one guy that stood out to me was uh, Kumar Sangakara. He was definitely, uh, from, a, from a bowling point of view, was the toughest guy I had uh, to bowl to. In, in all conditions. Um, again, tactically, skillfully, mentally, um, was just incredibly tough. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I didn't even think of that. That's actually yeah. one of the few guys that really just stand out above the rest. In terms yeah, of yeah. And for cricket and stuff, so. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then obviously, who's the hardest bowler you've ever faced? <laughs> uh, Look, people will laugh and they'll say, oh, it must be Mitchell Johnson because he's hit you on the head or he's broken your arm or something. So, look, he, there's no doubt he was tough, but uh, there's more my inability to deal with, uh, you know, at a time in my career where I technically wasn't very really good, um, that he obviously made it quite tough. And let's make no bones about it. I mean, he was bowling. He was, I think he was tough for most, most guys at that stage when he was in the prime of his career. Be, whether we were playing for South Africa or England, it doesn't matter. So, he was tough. Uh, obviously, Dale Stain at domestic level was was incredible. Um, I mean, when he was at his, uh, I mean, he was young and he came through the ranks at the same stage as what we do when he was bowling 150 plus and swinging the ball. Um, he, it was really tough. So, from a seeming point of view, those are the two guys that stood out. From a fast bowler's point of view, those are the two that stood out. Um, from a spinner's point of view, obviously your left-hander, obviously you know your off spinners are always going to pose you, you a lot of threats. So uh, Said Ajmal from Pakistan was a was a, was a tough challenge. Um, faced uh, obviously Abhijan Singh, who was really really tricky, um, and and we're a literal to a certain extent for, for a little bit that we played against him in county cricket as well. So I think there's a handful to pick there. Uh, you know Shane Warne, we faced at the back end of his career. So you know I mean. But eventually, there you saw his ability and his skill, and why he was the best, uh, you know, as a as a leg So, uh, those are the, those are the names from a, from a bowling from a, having faced bowlers. Those are the guys that stood out to me. Yeah. What is your most memorable innings or match that you ever played? Most memorable innings. Um, look, obviously, the one in Potsdam stands out. I think having to, you know, you know when we needed to score four or three of the last over and then, you know, winning the game um, and hitting a six and so on, you know, I mean, I only scored about, I think, 20 odd or 30 odd, but I think in the current, in the scenario, that was definitely, that always will be a highlight for me. Um, it's something that you grow up wanting to do and wanting to be able to do at international level. So to be able to have done that at some stage was, was special. And obviously, I hoped I, I, could have, I could have done that a lot more, but yeah, that was definitely a highlight. Um, and obviously, from a first-class point of view, there's you know here and there there's the innings where, as you know, play, scoring a hundred where the teams basically uh, are trying to avoid the follow-on and you seven or six wickets down, you end up scoring a hundred, um, which I managed to do for at that stage for the Dolphins, which was obviously special. But you know, Nick, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of knocks as a, or innings as a all-rounder where you come into number six or seven where. You maybe score a 50 or you maybe score a 60 under really trying circumstances, which probably has more value than, than scoring. A, I mean, obviously, 100 is 100. But in the current circumstances, you won't be able to score 100. But scoring a 60 or 70 um, was, you know, there's a lot of those scenarios, which, which was really um, enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to just move on to, to some of the questions I ask all my guests. Um, okay. I don't prepare you for these on purpose because it's good to, to get your instinctual answers. Um, okay. I don't know if you're much of a reader, but the first one is normally, what are the, the three books, best books you've ever re uh, read? 
Okay, so first one is Good to Great um, by Jim Collins, which is, I found a, a really a brilliant book that I read. Funny enough, I, I read um, The Elephant Whisperer by Lawrence Anthony, which to me was, I mean, I'm, I'm a man about wildlife and, and animals, so that was, uh, I love the story. Yeah. Um, and I'm in the middle at the moment, I've just started uh, Simon Sinek's book um, on, on Leaders Eat Last, so um, I found that very insightful. So yeah, yeah. from a reading perspective, that's, that's yeah, where it is at the moment. Uh, there's one I saw a book here in, in the house. I think it's called "Elephants in My Kitchen" or something. Um, I <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, it seems. Uh, I think. Okay. Yeah, no, it just seems to be a cool book. I, I read a couple of pages, so I thought maybe you can check it out. Uh, look, I, at the moment with the studying, my time for reading is a bit limited. So uh, you know, when I am reading, I'm I'm doing research and, and all of that. So I'm hoping that at the end of the year, when the semester's all done, I can in indulging and finish a couple of books that I haven't, but yeah, I do enjoy a bit of alone time and reading a bit, so I'm yeah, hoping to catch up on a couple of books. Yeah. What are the five most important things in your life right now? Um, my family, or religion, well, let's say religion and family. Uh, my wife and my kids are, you know, that's what life goes about to me, you know, so my decisions are based with decisions I make are, are made around my family and what's important for them first. Um, and that's the driving force of, of all my decisions. So I'd say, yeah, as I say, religion, family, um, friends is, 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 you know, is massive for me and, and trying to, and spending time and interacting. Um, and obviously exercise and, and being outdoors. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd arrange it at that. I'd say religion, family, um, Friends, exercise, and sport. Uh, I'd say sport, and then the last one would be animals. I enjoy animals, and and, um, and I suppose if I can add a six one music, <laughs> which I, I love music, but I but I'm not I'm not an instru- I don't play any instruments. But I, in my my second life, I wish I could ever play a, in a band or some sort. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we all do. All of us sportsmen do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if you could speak to a young version of yourself, what is one message you'd give to him? Um, I would say, it's a, you know, for obviously, like, you know, follow your, find out what it is you want to do and follow your, your dream and, and, and go for it. Um, and that, that, as as you go on life is short so you know use every day don't don't wait for time but may don't wait for the days to come but make the days count you know and and as i say use every day that you can to follow your dreams um i'd say enjoy life for what it is and i'd say you know enjoy everything about life and make the most of it and try and Try and make a difference in people's lives, and try and um, you know you'll you'll have an opportunity somewhere along the line. God's given you a talent to and an ability to serve a purpose, and in that you you've got an opportunity to make an effect and an influence on people's lives, and, and that that is one of the I think the things that you could fulfill um, would give you a lot of enjoyment and fulfillment is if you can do that. Awesome. So obviously you've spoken about the, the sports management company you're involved in. Um, yeah. Some young cricketers listening to this and Mark want to reach out to you. Where can they do that? Yeah, look, it's, um, so it's basically the Navigant group. Um, you know, so yeah, it's, um, it's Navigant sports management. And look, as I say, I, I, I am on Twitter. I think it's, yeah, I'm not a big Twitter and social media guy, um, but you can find me there. On, I think it's Ryan Mac or 2310, I think, or something like that. But other than that, I mean, I'm, I'm at, at Great College and I'm fully employed over here, so they, you know, guys can get hold of me there. So yeah, these different different platforms. Um, I think that's basically you know the access points and so on. But look, to me, it, it goes about trying to manage the person and the athlete and make the best decisions for their career. It's not necessarily just about taking commission and, and trying to get the best contact. It's trying to make the best decision and manage the, the, the guy at the end of, or the, the, 
the, the, the person, the sportsman, be it a guy or a, or a girl, it doesn't matter, just to make the best decisions for them and for their career and try and mentor, mentor them through the process. So, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Well, Mac, thanks so much. Right. I appreciate your time, man, and I appreciate uh, your insights. And yeah, you've given us time away from your family. So thanks a lot, man. Cheers, Nick. No, thanks. Thanks for the time and the chat. I hope, uh, hope there's some good stuff to come out of it. For sure. Yeah, I'll keep you updated and let you know when uh, when we post it and all of that. Okay. Perfect. No problem. All the best. That's that. Thanks, Nick. Catch up soon. Cheers, bud. Cheers, man. Bye, bye.